Gentlemen, my name is Vishal Khanna from Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, which we call as FIKI. FIKI is the largest and apex business organization, which is a voice of India's business and industry. And in FIKI, we have many committees. And one of the leading committee in FIKI we have is FIKI National Startup Committee, which actively advocates for policy reforms with a vision to strengthen India's thriving startup and innovation ecosystems. The intent of FIKI Startup Committee is to foster economic growth by leveraging disruptive innovation. This year, particular, FIKI Startup Committee focuses on women entrepreneurship, agriculture, and disruptive innovation. On behalf of FIKI, FIKI Flow, and FIKI Startup Committee, a very warm welcome to all the distinguished guests, esteemed members of FIKI Flow and FITT, and most important, the talented entrepreneurs of our country. So let's give a big round of applause to all of us for presenting here. <laughs> FIKI, uh, this event is jointly organized by FIKI and FIKI Flow. We thank FIKI Flow for the same. And I request you, all of you, to give another round of applause for all the women of our country. Because without their support, we wouldn't have been here. Thank you. Let's start this evening by not only celebrating the essence of women entrepreneurship, but also embracing the remarkable journey, undying spirit, resilience, and breakthrough, all under the theme, women's means business. Without taking much time, I request, and we also would like to uh, share that, we have Mr. Rohit Bansal, who is the esteemed chairman of Wiki Startup Committee, co-founder of Titan Capital Snap Deal, and we have also the co-chair of Wiki Startup Committee, Ms. Gadalak, co-founder of Konasa Consumer Library. So please give a, give a round of applause to our chair and co-chair. I invite Mr. Rohit Bansal, chairman of Fiki Startup Committee, for his insightful welcome address. Over to you, sir. Am I audible? OK, fantastic. Well, good evening, everyone. and. Uh, Welcome everyone to this special, very special evening for us. Uh, as you all know, entrepreneurship is extremely, extremely hard. Uh, having been an entrepreneur myself and having seen journeys of many, many entrepreneurs through the years, I've seen this to be a very, very hard, very exhilarating, but at the same time, very, very uh, enriching and rewarding experience as well. As an entrepreneur, many times you go through these experiences and Almost every, every other month, especially in the early stages, you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why is this happening only to me? And it's in those moments that learning from the journeys of others and knowing that every other entrepreneur has also gone through this uh, brings in a lot of inspiration, brings in a lot of courage. It also tells us that it's not only us and the universe is not conspiring to screw only our happiness. <laughs> there are many other entrepreneurs who've been through this journey. And I've seen again and again that no matter how rosy and exciting a journey looks from the outside, at the inside, even the most successful businesses that are created till date go through their own ups and downs, learning curves, near-death experiences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, today, I'm very, very excited for us to present a panel before you of women leaders who've built and supported fantastic businesses in India. Uh, you know, I myself, having known all of them, have learned a tremendous amount uh, from their journeys. They built businesses which are extremely respected by their customers, by investors, by ecosystem at large. And I'm sure a lot of learnings will come for everyone, everyone present here, listening to listening to their journey. So thank you so much. For, I know uh, Ragini, Ghazal, uh, Rashi, and Arti all are very very busy, and you know. They've made time for this panel, taken flights in some cases, and um, accommodated the schedule. So thank you so much for being here. I also thank uh, you know, Fiki Flo, who's our partner for this event, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as FITT, uh, for allowing us all the, all the facilities for making this event possible. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to our partners. Uh, looking forward to an enriching discussion and uh, calling, calling my uh, sort of Fiki Flow president to give a welcome address as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insight for startup ecosystem. We are assured that under the leadership of your, of course, Gazal ma'am, we are going a great way in the startup, accelerating startup innovation ecosystem. 
So now moving ahead, I would request Honorable President FLO, Ms. Joyshri Das Verma, to give her special address and enlighten us with her perspectives. Please give a round of applause. A very good evening. So am I audible? I think I have to ask the same question. <laughs> all right. So a warm welcome uh, to all of you. And uh, looking forward, I think this first of our uh, initiative where three of us are partnering uh, together and uh, look forward to uh, more. So I think the title of the evening today, Women Mean Business. I think we are not only in business, we are in war zone at all times managing our uh, families, home, carriers, and the men in our life. So it's like we mean more than business. And uh, anyway, I would like to add here that more than women me means business, I think it's more business need women. So on that note, I'm sure each one of you will resonate with this. So women contribute diverse perspectives, innovative ideas, and exceptional leadership qualities that are crucial for the business success. When we emphasize that business needs women, we are underscoring the essential role play women play in driving economic growth and sustainability. So I think right from business, we also sustain our family members' growth, our children. So it's, I mean, we are there in that space at all times. So Indian women, despite constituting 48% of, uh, of, uh, of the population, contribute only 18% to the gross domestic product, found a study by the National Family Health Survey. So bridging the gender gap in employment could potentially lead to a 30% increase in the country's GDP as per the study. So I think we have to get into that space and increase the statistics where we are and where we should be. So businesses that em embrace gender diversity, I mean, uh, they perform, they tend to perform better as they can tap into the full potential of their workforce and better understand and cater to the needs of a diverse customer base. And as women, when we are multitasking at all times, and we kind, we don't have a blinkers on, so we have that 360 degree perspective of every matter at all times, so yeah, I think for every field of life, I, I mean, we get that whole uh, dimension which actually works more better. And the more women of us in business, I think it's better, better for the country and better for all of us. So therefore, it's not just that women participating in business, it's also about recognizing that businesses thrive when they are actively include and support women in all aspects of their operations from leadership roles to decision-making processes, women's voices and perspectives are invaluable assets that businesses cannot overlook to afford, uh, afford to overlook. Today we have with us a panel of women who just do not mean business, but also means a lot to the business world. I think lovely to have you all here, and I think everyone must be waiting to hear it right from you. So Flo has collaborated with the FIKI Startup Committee and IIT to put this uh, together, and it's an extension of Flo's commitment to fostering a conducive environment for women in the business world. The objective is to showcase the significant role women play in driving business growth and innovation. By highlighting successful women entrepreneurs and leaders, we seek to inspire and empower more women to pursue their entrepreneurial ambitions and excel in the careers. Flow as a business chamber for women is renowned for its impactful initiatives aimed at empowering women in business and entrepreneurship. Since last 40 years, Flow has been working towards the mission of propelling women into greater economic, social, and political spheres of power. Through this program, Flo, along with his partners, aim to amplify the voices of women in business, celebrate their achievements, and pave the way for a more 
inclusive and gender equal future in the business world. So I just remembered a discussion wherein women were said to be like boiled eggs. We are either too soft or too hard, but we're never quite right. Well, I cannot say if that analogy is apt or not, but I do believe that change for women will come embodying the perfect balance of feminine qualities. In my view, it will come from changing the system. So our current system still stacks the odds against the women. We learn, we earn less, we secure less investment, and receive fewer opportunities to develop and lead. So there is just not one solution here. Women need to be paid fairly, they need access to company benefits, and a culture that supports them. And they also need access to opportunities that boost them in leadership and technical jobs that are valued and highly paid. And uh, the more we create a system that works for women, the less women and girls can worry about wh how they fit into the system. So our discussions today will contribute significantly to enforcing, to reinforcing the message that gender equality and women's empowerment are paramount for our societies and economics. I urge you all to listen, to be inspired by the stories shared here today, and let's all work to continue to support each other and uplift each other as we strive for excellence in this world of business. Thank you so much, and look forward to hearing from all of you there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was truly splendid to hear you on your thoughts of gender equality. And I re uh, invite the following panelists on stage. Uh, and I also request you, ma'am, to present them green certificates. So, uh, Ms. Ghazal Alag, uh, co-chair of Fiki Startup Committee and co-founder of Hon Honasa Consumer Limited. Ma'am, could you please join us on stage? Also, I would like to call upon Ms. Rashi Narang, founder of Head Up for Tales. Next, we have Ms. Arti Gupta, National Head of Fiki Flow Startup and Chief Investment Officer of Anikart Ventures. Next, I would like to call Ms. Ragni Das, co-founder of Leap Club, who is also the moderator of the session. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So now we can start with the panel discussion. Over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm not going to say, can you hear me? Because I'm sure you can hear me. Uh, I'm Ragini, the co-founder at Leap.Club, a network exclusively for women. Uh, before starting Leap.Club about four years ago, in fact, exactly four years ago, uh, I spent about six years uh, building Zomato across various sales and growth roles across geographies. Outside of work, I'm a plant mom, I'm a dog mom, uh, I'm an f &B enthusiast, as Gazelle and I just spoke about. And uh, in my free time, I work with young women in business. So that's a little bit about me. And with me on this fabulous panel, we have Dr. Aarti Gupta, who's been at the helm of her family office, which is the DM Gupta family and the Jagran group for the last 13 years. She's also the chief investment officer at Anikarth Ventures, an angel investing firm that invests in innovative early stage startups with transformative solutions. She's also an independent director with Jindal Stainless Deals and contributes to the boards of several family owned businesses and startups in India. Can I please have a huge round of applause for her? Next up is my favorite track, Gazal Ella, co-founder at Honasa Consumer Limited, the brainchild behind Mama Earth, where she spearheads innovation, community, and new brand initiatives. She understands the psychology and the personal eye that personal care products need in India and works very, very closely with a large number of consumers to develop products that address problems that people face on the daily. Also a doting mom, and a passionate artist from what we know. And of course, we have Rashi Narang, someone who left her glorious corporate job to follow her heart 16 years ago to start Heads Up for Tales. Today, the brand has 90 plus stores, Pan India, and a prominent online presence as the go-to brand for all pet needs, including mine. Uh, besides opening many stores across the country and expanding her online presence, the company has also just launched their dream project, which is called the Heads Up for Tales Foundation, uh, to help sensitize children and elders alike towards other beings. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us, and very, very kicked to do this together. Uh, over the next one hour, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the experiences and insights of these stellar leaders who've navigated challenges of building, growing, and fueling businesses. We're gonna go over practical advice, real world solutions, advice, success, failure stories, and we'll close with the last 15 minute at around say 5.50 odd for a quick Q&A so that you can ask them your questions as well. We'll give you the mic, so don't worry about that. But uh, first thing first, I am going to get a little bit of a leap.club tradition into play. We're going to start today with a quick game of rapid fire. As the name suggests, uh, you have to be rapid and full of fire. I see a lot of Kejo fans in the audience. Um, Gazel, can we start with you? Already? Already. Already. You seem ready. <laughs> We might need another mic, or this works. This should work, yeah. Can we please get the mics Hello. checked? Hello, yeah, working. Working? OK, yeah. cool. Ready? I didn't delay the rapid fire. <laughs> early stage building or building at scale? I'm doing both, but early stage building. A misconception about startup building you'd like to bust today? That we are working 24-7. I think we might be working 24-7 in the initial phase, which is one and a half, two years, but it does get better after that. True or false, the mom guilt eventually goes away. False. Doesn't go away. Hasn't gone away for me, at least. A quote you live by? Uh, a lot of quotes, but I think one quote that, and this is now I'm taking time to think which one That's should fine. I call. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I love um, when... It, I love this particular one, which says that ideas are only as good as, ex as its execution. So execution is the key. Don't keep thinking, start executing. Do you miss the pre-Mama Earth days? Gazil, the artist at Bandstand. 
I like the last personalized bit. Um, I love Ghazal the now, the entrepreneur, but I don't want to let Ghazal the artist go anywhere. So, very fair. What's a productivity hack you personally vouch for? Prioritizing and calendarizing, not just professional stuff, but also your personal commitments. Love that. Rashi, you're next. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a hamper, uh, thanks to Rohit. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. He's, he's now wondering what is the hamper. <laughs> would, would you have given me controversial answers? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Going local or going global? Local, but just dabbling in, glo in global. Nice, nice. <laughs> Complete the following sentence. If you could get one superpower for the day, what would it be? To be able to really speak animal language. <laughs> Always on brand. <laughs> in one word, describe what it's like to work with family. Actually amazing. Yeah. A book you keep going back to. Um, I love books, so I'm very conflicted on which one to say, but I think um, The Everyday Hero Manifesto yeah. by Robin Sharma. Yeah. I love that book. Um, a common misconception about being a founder. Actually, I'm going to now um, go, like, you know, Ghazal just said that there's a lot of freedom. I'm just going to say that <laughs> people assume there's so much freedom <laughs> that you're your own boss. But, you know, every responsibility and everybody's roles eventually, you know, stop at you. And so there is so much responsibility. <laughs> and, the and, buck doesn't yeah. stop at all. <laughs> yeah. What's a productivity hack you love? Spending an hour on Sunday to meticulously plan my week ahead. Everyone's a planner here. I love it. <laughs> Aarti, you're next. Can we have more mics, if that's possible? I think that's not working. Okay, we yeah. have. Okay. Not working. Okay, I hope you're all set. Okay. The one mistake you made in your career. I think not planning my professional trajectory for a post-marriage. Can't post stint. Fair. An investment thesis you regret and one you're proud of. Tricky, huh? Uh, regret. I think very initial in my, uh, when I started investing, I used to rely on due diligence of leads and I no longer do that. Because it and, takes a lot of time. Uh, no, in the sense like I don't just rely on someone else's due diligence. I, you know, I don't take things at face value, uh, especially when deals are coming out of networks. And something which I'm proud of, uh, uh, an investment thesis, I think it's like uh, for always, I've not just from the last two years, for me it's been profit, profitability over uh, valuation, so. Always. The one common misconception budding founders have about angel investors. The fact that they think uh, we are on opposing sides, right? We are on the same team. So in case of trouble, do come to us. <laughs> Don't be scared of us. Don't be scared of us. <laughs> We're not gonna bite. <laughs> Hockey stick growth. Boon or bane? It's a double-edged sword. If you have funding, it's a boon. Yeah. If you don't have the right team and funding, it's a bane. Product market fit or founder market fit? I think founder product fit. Got it. So that's founder market fit? Yeah, the, having the right founder build the right and product. And the right, right product, yeah. fair. Yeah. And what's your productivity hack? Like, what's the one you vouch for? So I've been taking almost two flights a week for the last couple of years. So uh, it's maximizing my in the sky time. So I have no content on my iPad, uh, no books which I carry anymore. And I just carry my Notability app and I use it to think because it's that one time where I don't have to react, right? Like yeah. I don't have to react to messages, emails, people coming in. So uh, that's been a huge productivity hack for me. Recently. Yeah, the no slack hour is the best hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that we have the easier questions done and we've set the tone with those fabulous answers, uh, I'm going to bring the tougher questions on, but please can we have a quick round of applause? They have uh, graduated to the coffee couch from my couch. <laughs> Uh, he's saying the mic will take six seconds to start, so those do work. Okay, now, so so many of us, and I'm sure all of you here who are here, um, harbor the founder dream, right? And more often than not, I think what we don't hear about 
is how the founders we know and we admire actually didn't start off with that intention at all. There were uh, careers that were let go off, there were pivots that were made, and there were leaps, multiple leaps in some cases that were taken. And on that note, I actually want to start today's fireside with a very important question, which is the sliding door moment for all of these women, right? That one minute or that one moment that just changed your life and brought you to the place where you are today. Uh, Rashi, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we, of course, all know you for the authentic brand you're building, for the person you are and everything you built to the, uh, bring to the table. But what was your catalyst to really start Heads Up for Tales, as we all, of course, know today? It was my dog, Sara. Um, I've grown up always with the dog at home, but I think I was always a child in the family versus becoming a parent to Sara after I got married. And I just couldn't find anything for her in the market. Um, and it was literally, it was, you know, that, that moment was her first birthday when I went to find a little gift for her and I, I came home empty. It was literally not one thing that I could, that I felt was of quality enough for my little girl. And that's really what inspired Heads Up for Tales to start. Wow. So it was Sarah's birthday. Yes. And which is why everything is. Like you walk into a store, there's Sarah right Absolutely. There. <laughs> what about you, Aarti? Um, going from uh, Harvard to running your family office to then getting a PhD. Of course, your journey sounds ambitious and fascinating to all of us. But what do we not know and what do we not read about? What was your biggest risk? Um, considering the multiple hats that you don today as an investor? So for me, you know, I was all of 24 when I moved from Boston and got married into Kanpur, right? And um, into a loving family and very encouraging as well. I always knew I had to work, but I, I, I didn't know where. So my husband, who was building our radio division then, which is now Radio City, uh, told me, come join me in my business. And I joined him as the marketing head, right? And uh, somehow over the next one and a half, two years where I was playing that role, honestly, that felt very ceremonious or as a token, right? You're part of the family, you've given that title. And I, there was this, and I very vividly remember, you know, one of those midnight feeding sessions with my daughter. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what am I doing, right? And in that moment, I applied for a PhD at IIT Kanpur. So for me, the sliding door moment was that because honestly, it was everybody around thought that I was crazy, that you know I was already working in the family business in this great position and everything. And I wanted to go back to school yeah. with an 18 month old and leave that. But for me, it was amazing because in addition to everything else it taught me, which I'm using today in terms of knowledge, I think it helped me sort of charter uncharted territory, right? And take that leap of faith. And that was what was important. I think that helped me take on the role or ask for the role of building up a family office. I'm one of the few daughter-in-laws who handle money for the family, right? It's usually the patriarch uh, or the sons in the family who handle. But I got that courage because and it's not like I've studied finance, but I, you know, and same way with investing in startups out of Kanpur. So I think for me, it was uh, applying and actually going ahead. One of the proudest moments in my life is when my six-year-old was sitting in the audience and I was defending my thesis. That's fabulous and very, I have goosebumps, so. I'm throwing my next question to Gazelle. Now, we all, of course, know Mama Earth for the solid brand that you and Varun have built today. But what was your biggest and the most rewarding risk uh, that you've ever taken in your career? And how do you feel, Gazal, that's impacted the way you view decision-making, say, today? I think there have been multiple small moments which have been quite life-changing for us. Um, I wouldn't repeat at the cost of repeating. The first one, of course, was deciding to start up, choosing to give up on the luxury and the comfort of a fixed income coming to your house every month and saying that, yes, I have a 15-month-old child, but I'm going to take the risk and we are going to just start Mama Earth Up as our flagship brand. Um, so I think the first moment was that, but going a little beyond that, I think the second moment which which really changed the trajectory of the entire organization was choosing to come up with our second brand, which was the Derma Company. And recently we talked about the fact that the Dermaco 
is in less than four years is now a 500 crore ARR brand. We got a lot of pushbacks from a lot of people saying this is not the right strategy. Your focus is going to go haywire. You're not, you don't think Mama Earth is going to be bigger than what it is today. And that's the reason why you're we're starting the second brand. But I think even at that point of time, it was just finding a white space. And rather than waiting for somebody else to come in and cater to that white space, why not us? So it was serving to our consumers who already had asked us for those kind of products. And rather than saying that because Mama Earth is in the natural space, Dermaco is in the active ingredient space, we will not cater to that set of consumers. They are not RTG. We just opened horizons and said, how do we become the biggest and the largest FMCG company made and built out of India, possibly for India for the next five years, but with the potential of going global. And I think from that step to now having six brands in our portfolio, we have come a long way. We are a listed company, and we still see that there's a long, long way to grow uh, because each of these brands in themselves have the potential to become future mama arts. Absolutely. And I, yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> and we love this, right? Like, we love the initial phase of building. And I feel like there's so much to learn from everyone's journeys through those initial years. And when you say four years ago, I'm guessing this is peak COVID. Yes. Yeah, it is peak COVID. So I'm sure that wasn't easy, as amazing as it sounds today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now, right? The initial phase of building. Rashi, I'm going to start with you. Um, What's a customer acquisition strategy that you started off with, right? And I'm sure when you started 16 years ago, it looked very, very different. But has it evolved? How is it, say, now considering Rashi's, by the way, just launched Singapore? That's their first international market. And uh, I would love to know how this has changed from then to now. When we started out, um, it was a complete white space. And we spent a lot of time on education, on, of course, building products, supply chain, um, literally everything, right? There was nothing that existed. There was no talent to hire. There was no expertise. And there was really no customer, right? Nobody was thinking about any of the products that we were building. And so what we did was really just stand um, in spaces where we could talk to customers and talk to customers. And those insights and those conversations really gave us all, um, all the insights that we took to the table to build out products um, around problem areas that people didn't even know that they're facing. So no one is going to tell you, here's the problem and build for it. But they're just going to chat about their relationships with their pets, the good, the bad, you know, the easy, the difficult. And you just take that to the table and say, OK, how do I solve for this in particular? Uh, for example, someone you know, once said, oh, every time my Cocker Spaniel eats his food, his ears go into the bowl and they get dirty, so I have to tie them up, tie his ears up into a ponytail every meal. <laughs> you know? So that helped us build you know, an elevated bowl, which was uh, smaller on the top, you know, wider at the bottom, things like that. Like All of our product innovation has been done through that conversations with customers, design thinking without us really realizing that it was design thinking. And I think till today, we have a very strong consumer connect. Because of our stores, it really gives us a chance to meet our customers, to know them, to understand them, to personalize those relationships. My team members at the stores will know most customers' names, their pets' names, their birthdays, all of that. And I think really the strongest acquisition strategy that we still have is word of mouth. You know, there is, I mean, while we have been building um, and organizing our data and, you know, doing all of the usual D2C performance, all of that, I think truly at the end of it all, it is just being about brand, about sharing what we know, about learning as much as we can and educating, um, you know, customers about how can, I mean, if they know better, they can do better. And there is really nothing more special than the joy that pets bring into our homes, our hearts, our lives, and we just want for them to live their best life. So I think that um, just sharing as much as we know and, and word of mouth, it still is really our core, core customer. So that hasn't changed. It hasn't. Love that. And I, I feel like you were building a community way before it was cool to build a community. Right, And I, I feel like Heads Up for Tales is built on that ethos. And I absolutely agree. I think remembering your pet's name 
for me is the single biggest check uh, box so to speak yeah. every time i absolutely enter. i get a message yeah. for coco like on the birthday on like you know everything her meals run out maybe it's time to order i, I love it rashi i think it, it it's amazing so, so i actually moved from uh, delhi to bombay 6 uh, weeks ago and i think and my my dog i'm very possessive so i drove him down from delhi to bombay and uh, i remember uh, texting rashi because i think on blinkit uh the meals were sold out and uh, the only thing my dog can eat barring curd rice is just the heads up for tails meals and i remember texting her and she said half an hour it's reaching you lijimi is not going like this and i feel like that attention to detail and she didn't have to do it and i feel like she would have done it for anyone right and i feel like that is truly brand building and and i'll always remember that so thank, thank you, you so much Gazal, what about you? Of course, you've built multiple brands. You've acquired multiple brands. But what do you think are the three most important things to do before launching a D two C brand? Like, if you have to go back to when you were launching Mama Earth again, what were three things that you would tell the younger Gazal and Varun? So we've we've built four brands. We've acquired two. so i'm still in that phase of early building and starting a d2c brand our latest brand being stays which is a color cosmetic brand you guys should check it uh we've come up with a 3 in 1 and i'm like shameless about selling my product so yeah 3 in 1 lipstick three shades in one lipstick so do try uh but you know the fact that i do it regularly keeps me on top of things and we keep improvising on what was that most important thing that one should focus on while building a d2c or a digital first brand um and for me um the two basic principles are 3 p's and 3 c's so 3 p's your product your processes and your perspective how great and differentiated is your product what are the processes that you're following which will help consumers believe that it's a differentiated product so for example in case of mama earth it was certified safe a seal of safety on each and every product that we do which was not even a like not even talked about here in india while internationally countries had um massive exhaustive lists of ingredients that couldn't be used and here we brought in an agency which would certify each and every product and ingredients to be safe uh for not just the human skin but also for the environment and third thing is perspective perspective is something that keeps you going even when times get very very difficult and early phase of building i'm sure all of us sitting here and you guys know about it that early phase of building not being able to see those first sign of success is is always there and it's critical for you to motivate yourself to continue and keep going and pushing the bar saying that you know one day it will work um for us that perspective for me like for rashi it was um the well-being of the pets that we have at home and that was so strong for her that i'm sure during difficult times that kept you going um for me it was the well-being of the babies which is what i started uh, mama earth with saying that uh, do indian kids Did not deserve the best like are we any less that we are not being offered the right ingredients and we are putting the same ingredients onto the baby which are banned in other countries uh, so that kept me going even when we brought up color cosmetic brand called stays for me that um perspective was that um india is growing and the women in india joining workforce is on an increasing trend and for us to be able to support that we need makeup which is good for your skin and is long lasting so you don't have to go through the pain of reapplying it every day and we entered that space it was of course a white space within the company we didn't want our consumers to leave us because we didn't have this one offering which is where we brought in the uh, brand but it has to be something around the perspective around the brand that you're building followed by 3 c's i know this is not just one but i feel these two things 3 p's and 3 c's are the most important 3 c's is your one consumer the competition and the cost i think this is also very very important you can't neglect one for the other your consumer should be at the heart of everything that you do the first lens that you should put be it building a product be it marketing be it communication needs to be your consumer sometimes we get too involved in work that we start 
doing the manufacturer speak, as I call it, uh, that that doesn't connect with 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 the consumers that you're selling to. Uh, second, like I said, competition. Be aware of who you are competing with in your mind to be able to get shares to begin with, and then later on start creating market. I think um, these two things are also very important early on for you to be able to uh, get early signs of success is when you're able to take certain share out of the competitive brands that you're competing with. That gives you a very strong product market fit, that feeling that yes, this is the right way, we need to continue on this and continue to build. And then comes cost. For the Indian market, being able to price it. See, India is not a cost-conscious market, it's a value-conscious market. But we cannot just focus on value, we also have to keep in mind that for you to be able to build at scale, and that scale can be different in each and every person's mind, what are those number of consumers that I want to acquire? What is the larger number of digital consumers available today? And hence, for me to achieve that scale, how much can I expect out of this cohort? And that helps you put your business model right, is what I feel, at least we've been doing that with all the recent brands that we've launched. Yeah, love that. In fact, when you were talking about the P's, I was like, she didn't mention pricing. But then, of course, the C for cost covers it. I think, what about you? Of course, you assess businesses from a very different lens every single day. What are some critical pieces uh, that you think one should keep in mind in the initial um, idea evaluation phase? I'm sure there are lots of budding founders in the audience today, but what are things that you feel people don't do often or often do wrong that is usually the norm? So obviously your, your usual suspects are there out there, right? Like when you're sort of evaluating business, how good is the team? What is the qualification of the founder? Is the founder fit to build a particular product or service? Product market fit? And all of these usual suspects, you have to take care of all of that. I think the unusual ones, or at least which I feel is out of the ordinary, I think is a little bit of uh, what you need to assess is the market timing. You could have a great team be building a great product, but just the timing is not right for that service or a product, right? So I think as investors, we evaluate if the market is ready for you, you know? And uh, second, I think uh, we assess uh, in terms of what is the support group which the founder has. I think that is very, very critical. Who is advising the founder or who is the mentor pool the founder is sort of uh, digging deep into, right? Because that plays a crucial role in how the startup sort of uh, takes off. And finally, I think regulatory uh, systems around in the country for that particular product and service also plays a role. I've had, I've invested in a fintech startup which had a great value proposition, but somehow the regulations around it changed, right? So that didn't take off. So I think regulations play a big role. So we now sort of assign a risk parameter to that as well. Do you remember maybe an investment that came to you very early on that you felt was great, but just too way or way ahead of its time? Oh, not really. Not that, not that I can think of uh, any investments which you know was way ahead of time. Because yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, how do you assess if you're, and, and for everyone, right? Like, how do you know that Am I too early in the game? Is it because there are no competitors? Like, what are signs to really look out for? I always feel that there is, you know, a lot of startups do come and say that there are no competitors to my particular thing. And I feel there might be a reason for it as well, right? Like, so start uh, founders fail to evaluate what might be the reason. Uh, you know, there might be people who tried this and you've not done enough research. And usually that's the case because... Honestly, I think, like Gazal also said, ideas are cheap, right? Everyone sort of thought of anything. If you think you have a novel idea, you're delusional. Yeah. I really feel that, right? It's all about how you're executing that idea. So I think timing plays a role in that, how that execution comes, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective. Um, I'm going to move to the slightly uh, important, but the tougher one, which is scaling culture and growth. Very, very important. The, the, in the toughest one. The toughest one. <laughs> no, but like how Rohit was saying, right? I think I genuinely believe that building a company is like literally you're jumping off a cliff then you're assembling an airplane on your way down, as our friend Reid Hoffman says. Uh, but 
I think the journey of a founder is like an extreme sport. And like Ghazal said, right, it is literally, I think, people might think if you're in year one versus year 10 versus year 20, things will look different. They don't. I think these three words play such a crucial role in every founder's life, whether they're waking up, sleeping, <laughs> in sleep, whatever. And Ghazal, I think we'll start with you. You, of course, like you said, you've been on the forefront of making multiple acquisitions. You have taken a company to IPO last year, which we love and are very proud of. But how do you manage the growth of your business while maintaining company culture and values? Uh, my second follow-up question is, what do those values look like today versus when they started? See, we are still fairly young. We are seven years old. Let me start by <laughs> putting that fact on the table. Uh, we have scaled the business while holding on, trying to hold on to our culture as well. Um, you know, I, I define culture. Culture is more like a song, but imagine if that song has only lyrics and no music to it. Culture is what forms the music to those lyrics which then eventually you remember and you don't even have to think about before acting or before singing that song because you're, you know, your memory is tuned to it. That's how I define culture for my organization. Um, and with an with a organization which is scaling as fast or growing as fast, it becomes very difficult to hold on to the culture and ensure that it, it goes deep down because newer people keep coming in, the iteration which happens uh, within the team itself goes up, goes down. Um, but I think one thing that has worked for us um, is having, is over communicating. That I think is underrated, but one of the most important things that one needs to do as leaders, as founders, uh, there comes a time uh, in building the organization where you feel that now you have such a large team and it's impossible to reach out to each and every one the way you were doing earlier. Um, and in that scenario, we, we came up with certain rituals. We came up with, like you did, the 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 rapid fire, um, we call our sessions is coffee with founders. And we do that every month. And every month we have a small group of 15 people coming to a room with us having coffee. And they can talk anything about company, anything about their personal lives. A lot of new joinees join in. Um, they get a chance to directly interact with us and ask questions. And not even once in the last two and a half, three years has that session just, just stayed for like one hour. It always goes up to two, two and a half hours. Yeah. And I think that has helped us stay relevant to the entire organization, no matter which level or which city or which um, you know, branch you're operating out of. This is one session where everybody gets invited and people get nominated to be a part of that session. Beyond the town hall. This beyond the, the town hall. Beyond the town hall. Town hall is an address that we do to the full organization that happens again every month. But this is beyond the town hall. Even beyond this, I'm not sure if it's okay to say, but we have sessions like Booze Not Business, where we are drinking it's okay to say. and we are not, it, it, is, it is just a platform where people do not feel judged for the kind of questions or the kind of conversations that they're they are having with us. Again, full access to the founders, to the leadership team, to the management. You're not allowed to talk business. And hence, the only conversations that you can have are personal or outside of work, which also I believe that has helped us come together in a way where we don't have to give them that, okay, these are the five words of culture that one needs to follow. When they know how we think, how we hustle, we value execution more than ideas, we value getting stuff done more than just putting data on presentations and showing us flurry charts, uh, they understand. And they also understand that they will get rewarded if they have this attitude towards building. So I think these are, these are a few rituals which have really um, helped us build that culture. It is still work in progress. I wouldn't say we are 100% there. Uh, like you said, we are possibly outgrowing um, the speed and execution of the business. Uh, we are not at speed with, with retaining the culture, but we are working towards it. And I think... It is going to be a work in progress for as long as we build the organization, so it's not going anywhere. Um, your second question was? Um, what, what did it look like earlier versus today? So I'm guessing it stayed the same, basis what you're saying? 
So I think that's the beauty of it. You know, we often talk about the fact what has changed, and a lot of things change, but it is very important to also ask what stayed the same. Um, so the spirit of hustle and getting work done still gets rewarded in our organization. Um, the, uh, you know, the value of frugality and not spending a penny without being able to count or measure ROI on it still stays as a core value within the company and people get rewarded for it. People get rewarded more for cost savings than scaling uh, growth. You know, if you have to measure the two, growth at what cost is now an often question you know, that you'll see us asking within the organization. And we did that for about two to three months. Now, teams themselves come up with that term and they say, this is how we are valuing. So we don't have to ask that. I think that's, that's, that's how I'd define culture, that if we don't no longer have to talk about certain things and they are coming up uh, to us with that same value, with that same outlook towards a problem, yeah. uh, then you are, you're possibly on the right path. Yeah. No, I want to commend your team on that. You know, I think both our teams were talking a couple of months ago, and and I remember Janvi Kurana, if I'm getting the name right. Uh, I think she was in touch with my team, and uh, and they were like, you know, Janvi said this, blah blah blah, and. I was like, she is sounding so sure about this. Like, there is no point going to anyone else, right? Like, so I feel like when your employees start acting like founders, that's when you know that your job is really done, right? And 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 I feel like, yeah, I think you've built a great team, and uh, kudos on that. Um, and you know, I think what you said uh, takes me back to one of our earlier sessions with Ankur Variku. I think back in 2020, um, that was the first ever masterclass we ever did. Um, peak COVID, uh, and he'd spoken about this, and the first topic was, of course, building culture and, you know, scaling teams. And he said that culture is how people act when shit hits the roof. And I feel like that is so true. I feel like culture is not the good days. It is not the IPO days. It's not the fundraise days. It's not the days uh, when there's a office party, right? I think culture is when shit really hits the roof and how people act. And that's when you know when you've built a good culture versus not. Uh, Rashi, I'm go coming to you, of course. You've uh, taken half two global arenas today with Singapore, but what's the biggest challenge that you feel um, you've kind of come across with this international scale or with rapid scale, and how do you kind of combat it on the daily? Okay, I have to be honest. Um, rapid scale is chaotic. It is crazy. And there were many times when I was like, how is anything happening? You know, you feel overwhelmed and you're like, you know, really trying to hold it together. Um, because you haven't done it before, at least, you know, my team and I hadn't done it before. So we were learning as we were growing, we were failing, we were making mistakes, we were, you know, quickly sort of picking it. Okay, how do we build a process around this? And I think the more you do it, the better you get, the stronger you get, you build structures and um, I wish I could say that it was it was great, it was easy, it was <laughs> meticulous, it it's happened never. exactly how we wanted it to, uh, but it, it, it hasn't. And I think that there are certain, um, certain chapters which are much more chaotic than others, right? So when you scale from say even two stores to 10, you're like, wow, how the hell do I plan inventory and so many other things and team members? And then you build that expertise and then it gets much easier for the next 20, 30, 40. And then you hit, you know, different different um, growth um, mountains which are harder to climb. Uh, but I think really uh, just building structures, bringing in better expertise. So you do outgrow people, right? You do outgrow expertise. You need to have different people at different points in your journey who can help you to navigate the complexities of that particular scale. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what we're trying to do one day at a time, yeah. um, building and solidifying and just you know, going to the next stage. Yeah, and I think also knowing that your zero to one does not have to be your one to ten. It it can't right? be. It, it, it cannot be. be right. And 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 I feel like we learned that in Zomato very early on because I think I was I was twenty two. I think twenty thirteen when I joined them, and I remember in twenty fifteen was one of our tef toughest years. I think Zomato was ever gone through. I think the teams were halved, and I was just like, my friends have gone. What is happening? And we were all asked to take salary cuts, and I did. And uh, thank God for that because of the IPO. But uh, I, I just feel like I think that was the testing time for, for the startup then. And I'm sure we've all been through those testing times when things just didn't look hunky-dory. And, and I remember as a young 
25 year old ragini just just complaining and being like why is this happening why are all the earlier bosses not here and this and that and then we realized and then we had this wave of new leaders who came in and to be honest took the company to wherever it is today and i feel like it's very important for i think young um not so young i think everyone in the organization to really understand that but sometimes i guess it just has to happen to you and then you learn it and so. it's never easy you know you get attached to your team members yeah. it's never easy especially the the ones that you've started the company with it's only a handful of you you spend hours and hours and of course you want to push them to upscale to learn yeah. but some of them just can't right yeah. you know some of them don't want to yeah. and those are and always it's not their fault as well it's not their <laughs> fault at all yeah. absolutely not so you support yeah. as much as you can and then keep growing from there yeah yeah and it's in fact i always say this is the toughest for the founder you know one might think it's very easy for founders to not feel it but i think we're all crying at night when it happens arti i'm going to move on to you because of course you look at this journey from a very different lens right um you're of course on multiple boards you're an investor so you see this journey for a lot of founders yeah. uh from a slightly different seat yeah. uh both men and women but what's your approach to building teams in this new paradigm or in this new world so obviously you know like and fortunately uh, i've had the experience of uh, working with small teams in our family office or uh, you know seeing large teams built in our family business like you know whether it's the newspaper or the radio division or or even working uh, in organizations like fiki flow where we work with uh, members across team members across the country uh, one of the most important things is culture right uh, and the vision uh if you're able to sort of it precipitates all the way down uh to every team member but one thing which we've uh, been thinking a lot or at least i've been thinking a lot from our family office perspective also while building a team is to think of this concept of what if i'm not there tomorrow what happens to the team is the team equipped enough to handle what i'm doing today uh if i'm not there tomorrow and that i think uh sort of uh, this question came out in one of such panel discussions and from then i've been sort of trying and building a team putting that lens on as well another aspect i think when we are building teams is uh, diversity and by diversity i don't mean just gender diversity right diversity of thought are there team members who can differ with what you are proposing and that usually happens in family businesses or usually when you're the founder or leader that you know you sort of build uh you know birds of the same feather flock together sort of a thing so you sort of build people who have similar thought process so it's always important to bring in diversity in thought as well uh in the team so these are quite crucial for me yeah. same dna but diversity in thought yeah and i feel like they shouldn't be afraid to say or tell you their point of view right i think that's very important i'll i'll just add over there so yeah. i have a you know like a i, I champion women entrepreneurs i have a very strong bias uh for supporting women businesses right and uh i was actually genuinely pleased and i actually uh, congratulated one of my team members who came forward and said no ma'am we cannot just do it because she's a woman right like so it, i'm sure it took a lot of uh, cuts so you need to have members like this in your team who can sort of come forward you. and to challenge you yes yeah. i think you also uh, spoke about building that mentor pool right and like just having those people who show you the mirror and that's what i'm going to move on to next which is uh networking of course one of my favorite words for obvious reasons but i think the word is also abused so much right to a point where it's literally a buzzword today uh but at the same time i think i i completely agree with you when you say that i think it's the it's it's incredibly important uh, especially for women led businesses and and we see that every day with leap dot club and i want to talk about that a little bit right and let's maybe start by talking about the village that built both of you uh, rashi and gazal i think you both have very distinct journeys extremely distinct journeys in building your businesses but what was your most memorable moment where you feel like your community backed you up and whoever can start first they're like i'm not starting you start <laughs> uh so i think i've gone through that multiple times multiple multiple times in the last 7 years um early on in the journey it started with 
Before I had board of directors, uh, we had board of moms because we were starting out as a company which were creating baby care products, but our consumer was, were the moms the babies couldn't buy, right? Um, so that board has stayed with me till today. They are my biggest supporters. They are my biggest critique. They will tell me wherever I'm going wrong, be it with the products, be it with the communication, be it how I'm coming across intentionally or unintentionally, be it the way they want me to be. And like, like I said, the things that should stay the same no matter how large we become. Um, so I think that is, that is a community that I really, really cherish. They are going to come meet me two weeks down the line. They get to spend a whole day. And these, these are not folks who are employed. These are just folks who've supported us in building the brand from the scratch, from product philosophy to, from brand philosophy to development of products, to ingredients that go in it, to feedback on the products, helping us go through seven iterations before launching a product, and that they help us with till today on each and every launch that we do. Fab. How so many women are these? These are 1,300 women, pan-India. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, like, it is amazing, and like, no cost attached, they are the first ones to receive anything, anything that's in a prototype stage, not even a launch stage. So we have that approval before any product goes out in the market. I think following that, during IPO, we went through some difficult times where certain um, you know, rumors were doing the round and everybody thought, because we didn't speak up, um, we thought we were legally not allowed to speak up because of which we didn't. And, because we are always on the forefront and speaking on what's going on. People felt that they're not speaking because this is the truth. Uh, it has lingered on even today. Um, but during that time, I saw this female founder group really standing up for me and saying that, you know what, it doesn't matter what people are saying. You're building the right organization. Your basics are right. Your uh, company is strong financially. Like, what are you worried about? And when they realized that it was not just getting limited on a smaller scale, but going on a larger scale, they started speaking up socially about it as well. And that actually helped us turn the sentiment around slightly. So I think the, when, when people come up to you and support you during your difficult times, especially when you don't ask, ask for help, right? This is a time when you won't go to anyone and say that, you know what, we need help on this. But they still come to you and say that we are there. That's the biggest... Um, support and that's the community that one needs and I hear a lot about the fact that leap.club is that community for a lot of women for that matter women in my office who are working are all praises uh, that they're a part of it including Janvi that we talked about um, so I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing this nothing like this existed when I started out back in 2016 so this is something that I really missed so I was I hoping for many more leap.clubs though I second that Thank awesome. you. No, no, absolutely. I, and especially in like, and I hope that this, uh, what you're building sort of spreads to tier two, tier three cities as well, because when I wanted to invest from a city like Kanpur, I actually had nobody around me who could introduce me to a network. You know, obviously I could go through the family and say that, hey, make this introduction, but there was no, no community out there who could sort of teach you what to do or sort of help you or guide you or a group you could be a part of. So kudos to you for building what you are doing you know thank you so much that was a nice plug but thank you uh, Rashi what about you what's your community like um, for me I would say three communities customers they will speak up so strongly if something is not huffed they will be like that's not huffed you can't do this this experience wasn't good and you know when you're scaling you have new people those things are bound to happen but they will stand up and speak out like shout back at us and i and i'm so grateful for that because it's so easy to say uh, you know customers right. who care yeah. yeah yeah so i think that's been really special and um, again we've had folks who've stayed with us for like thousands of customers who stayed with us through the journey and um, we, were, we were one of those companies who was very early to the game. Like we were way ahead of the market and it took a long time for us to find our time. And in fact, I still think that we're far, far ahead of, of the market and it's probably be another many years till it really clicks. Um, so it's been, it's been hard and they have just cheered us on 
um, through the journey and through the years, which sometimes, you know, you lose patience. You're like, gosh, how long is this going <laughs> to take? But they really have stood by us. So I think consumers, my team, they're also, you know, during times when we're like, my God, there's competition. They're doing X, Y, Z, you know, sh we're going to, sometimes you go into those modes where you're like, oh my God, will we be left behind if we don't? And they will stand up and say, this is not half. You know, we like when I'm feeling down and out, they will be like, no, we're not doing this. You know, so just people that come and challenge me, come and say, um, why are we, why, why is, why is this even on the table? You yeah. know, and that just feels so good. And thirdly, I think just friends and family, I can't leave them out. Like, you know, especially as a working mom, heart is always torn, guilt feels heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're always trying to be like, no, you know, <laughs> I mean, how the hell do I hold this together? Especially when the kids are young, right? And then sometimes you, you're so, there's so much going on. Both are full-time jobs. You can't show up for friends and family and be all that you want to be. And then them just understanding and still being there, you know, that's just really, really precious. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. And like Gazul was saying, right? Like the fact that our parents sometimes come because we can't, make time, I think that's incredibly beautiful and important, right? And I, and I feel like it's very underrated, like having supportive parents, partners, family, friends, all of it. Um, we'd love to learn from your experience here too, Aarti. Uh, of course, networking is not as easy as it sounds at all. Um, so where do and how do women really begin creating that inclusive, that supported uh, network, both online and offline? You mentioned you're in Kanpur. So it may not always be um, easily accessible, so to speak, right? So what do you do to kind of stay ahead of the curve? So I think, uh, you know, again, like organizations like Wikiflow are a, are a great uh, 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 set up to sort of network. And I personally uh, built a very, very strong community of friends and supporters in this organization. Many of them are in the audience here today, so you know, they always show up, so kudos to that. Thank you, thank you so much. But uh, what that helps is like, you know, in every city I go, there's sort of a friend I can reach out to and stuff like that, so be a part of organizations. I think what women, especially women don't do enough is put themselves out there, right? They don't, they, they try to reach out when uh, there's work. And network, you cannot network when you, when you need something from the other person, yeah. right? Because that's not networking. Yeah. So I think that's a big mis misconception which a lot of people have, that I'll network when I need to fundraise. I'll network when I need to make this connect. Yeah. That's not networking. You network when you have nothing to ask, right? So uh, one needs to keep that in mind. But uh, again, like what you're building at Leap Club, great place to uh, sort of network and learn and get support. For me, I think even going back to school time and again sort of helps me build a community. So I, I like to do these short courses, whether it's at like, you know, one of these Ivy League universities or anywhere, wherever I get a chance, yeah. I like to go back to the classroom. And that helps me build a, a smaller community in, in those specific topics as well. Yeah. That's been something which I've constantly sort of uh, done once a year. I take a learning break. Right, and whether it's a week or ten days, and uh, sort of, and over over time, I've built these small communities depending upon the topic I'm learning about, and that's been very very helpful. Yeah, no, I love that, and you know, I think this takes me back to this something uh, Michelle Obama speaks about a lot, and she was in this talk show with Oprah, and she spoke about the kitchen table, right? Uh, the kitchen table is your core group of women and your sounding boards who'll show you the mirror, they'll cheer you on, they'll they'll talk to you on your good days, on your bad days, show up on your bad days. And I think it's very important, especially for women in their 30s and 40s to really have that, right? I think in schools and colleges, you're kind of, you have to be friends with who you can be friends with. But I think the beauty of really growing up, I guess, for the lack of a better word, is you can pick your own kitchen table. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just, I think, and for those of you who have not seen that snippet, um, in fact, the whole talk is great, but if you haven't, you should go back and check it out. I think it's, it's wonderful uh, how she puts it. I'm moving on to my favorite F word, which is funding. Uh, Gazal, we'll start with you. Uh, to raise or to bootstrap is always a question most, I think, budding founders go round and round in circles about, right? And we'd love your honest thoughts and your piece of advice and maybe tell us something that no one will tell us. 
I raised funds, but now I think that I could have bootstrapped as well. <laughs> so let me start by that. <laughs> so wow. Looking at Rohit right now. <laughs> Not the angel round. His teeth. Not the first round. <laughs> um, uh, I had certain misconceptions around, uh, for that matter, Varun and I both had certain misconceptions around building a business where we felt that you actually need a lot of money to get started and to get to scale that you want to achieve. Um, what we, what I've realized over time is, certain businesses you definitely need money. Certain businesses that you want to scale faster compared to others, you definitely need money, and hence that those are the places where you must raise. Um, but if you think that your business doesn't require those large amount of funds, so for example, building a personal care brand actually doesn't require to, you to have very large amounts of money. For the longest period of time, for us, money was lying in the bank. Um, in those cases, try bootstrap first. Put in the money that you have, the scaling up might take a little longer. If you're okay with it, if that's, that's, that's a vision that you, you can see for yourself, great, bootstrap. But if you see an opportunity where you feel that um, you wanna grab the most of it in record time, you don't want anyone else to, to hop on because in today's world, it's really competitive. You launch something today, three months down the line, you will see five other people talking about the same thing, same communication. Exactly the same, right? Yeah. Uh, have experienced it multiple times. Now, in those cases where you still feel that there is a differentiation that you're bringing into the market and you want to grab that opportunity way faster because you see it, then go all guns blazing and like raise funds for you to be able to scale that fast. Yeah, yeah. no, that's wonderful. Uh, Rashi, we spoke about this the first time we met. Um, you, of course, hold your values extremely close to your heart. And uh, we were talking about how there also has to be a founder-investor fit, right? So how do you effectively assess whether there's alignment um, of the organization, of the founder, with a particular venture capitalist, so to speak? I think it's tricky. And I think you have to be very, very clear about your why. Um, it's easy to get carried away. You know, somebody's giving you, offering you a great big check. Um, and you're like, okay, to hell with everything else. Let me figure it out from here. But I think that uh, for me, um, the why is like fire burning, you know, in my belly every day. I know people become better people when they open their hearts and lives to animals. And just, you know, just that magic is what I want to see more of in the world um, and I would never put a product into our stores that I don't believe in like for example raw hide shoes those white shoes that you know fill up 90% of a pet store they're like hide like buffalo hide which is black and it's bleached 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 into a white color and given to a dog it's a multi I don't even know how many crore market I would definitely profit from it that's just the most, everybody uses those products. We don't even keep them at half. And I was very forthright with my investors that there can never be any compromise on quality, on, quality, on product, on how we're going to build. It has to and always will be pet first. And some people don't align with that, right? And some people are forthright in the beginning. Some people may come a little bit later to say, hey, this brand is doing so well. You know, why don't you build like that? And, you know, I know very well that no way, I will not. You know, I will never compromise and do some great genius marketing and give some nonsense to a pet who can't even speak up and say what they really feel. Yeah. Um, so there have been clashes, uh, but I was always upfront. And I think now the... Now it's very clear that we will not do anything that doesn't align with value system. So I think it's about conversation, about authenticity, about just being open, about what you're trying to build. And if that doesn't fit your investors' mindset or their timelines, then it's just nice to be upfront. Yeah, and staying true yeah. to your values. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I remember, I think, so many times initially in the initial phases, people would tell us, just... just make it free don't make it a paid community right and or open it up to men i've heard even that right and i'm just like i don't align like it just is not something anand and i believe in right and and i think i i agree with you and it's very tough to say no to money because money is green but uh, it's also that much more important too 
thank you for sharing. Um, Aarti, I'm, um, of course, coming to you because very different lens. What are your top three rules while making decisions about investing in a startup? And what are your biggest green and red flags? Okay. So three rules. Um, uh, what is the value proposition the startup's bringing to the table, right? I, what problem are you really solving? What is the valuation, right? I invest in public markets as well as private, like, you know, and I feel every business has a particular price and uh, you need to buy it at the right price to be able to make money out of it, right, as an investor. And third, so value proposition, valuation, and third is what values are you bringing, right? What does the business stand for? I think that's a, that's a big, big rule for us, right? Nothing unethical, nothing wishy-washy, even at an early stage, works, right? Because I think that sets the tone for the company. Nothing under the table, no gray areas. How you're building the company has to be built uh, very cleanly on very strong core ethical values. So value proposition, valuation, and values. Uh, the biggest red flag, uh, barring the unethical part, right? Uh, uh, I get very iffy about founders who don't know their numbers, right? Especially the ones who give these ballpark numbers. I think if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know your finances, male, female, regardless, then uh, you're not the right person for the business. Uh, the biggest green flag, I think founders, you know, like Rashi and Ghazal, who have a very strong connect to what they're building, right? Like a personal connect. Like I could literally see in Rashi's eyes, the, the love she feels for animals, or like in Guzzle's eyes, like, you know, when she's talking about it, she's so passionate because building businesses is very, very difficult, right? Whether at an early stage, whether, you know, we run a business which is 80 year old, uh, but uh, it requires to have a very strong personal connect which can get you through that, those ups and downs, right? So yeah. that's a big green flag, like founders who have a very strong personal connect to what they're building. Maybe a problem they faced personally. Yeah. Yeah. And are the right people to build it, of yes. course. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we're, I'm down to my last question and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience's questions for the next 10 minutes because we know someone has a flight to take. Um, last quick piece of advice from all three of you to budding founders, men and women, both. We'll start with Aarti. <laughs> So I want to say this, like, you know, uh, ships don't sink because of the water outside. They sink when the water gets in. So there's always going to be chaos outside. As long as you don't let that chaos get in your company, in yourself, right, uh, you're okay to go. And I just want to add one specific advice to all women out there, right, because uh, go for it. Take that risk. If you're thinking that whether I'm, you know, good enough to be either take the job or build this business, trust me, you're not just qualified, you're overqualified, right? That's the case with women. So those are my two bits. Love that. Um, wow. I'm just trying to think, what would I tell myself like so many years ago? Um, I think that um, I would say that just remembering that there is no, there, success and failure are not opposite signs. Uh, I mean, they're not opposite um, sides of a coin. It's actually success, a failure is actually a part of success. And you have to fail multiple times because every time you fail, you learn. And every time you learn, you grow. And, um, every, you know, when I think of the number of obstacles that have come, and there have been so many, and it's been a hard, hard route to walk. Um, it feels so difficult in that moment, but every time you overcome it, I feel like every one of those have actually come to serve me, you know, to, to help me become stronger, wiser, better in so many ways. So I think that just remembering that when you're going through a hard time, because the road is hard when you're building, um, and then just being able to, to stay with it and, you know, you fall down uh, six times, you know, you get up seven, like really just keep get, building that resilience to keep getting up. And I think that really one more thing that's important is just having a very strong why, because when these challenges come, if you have a strong why, it helps you to get up that seventh time and keep, keep walking forward. 
I think I very deeply resonate with both of them on what they said. I, I don't think I can add any better advice. When you're a budding entrepreneur, there's so many questions and doubts that are crossing your mind. You're never sure of your idea. You're never sure if you should take that first step. But the only way to know is by taking that first step, right? Till the time you don't take it, you'd never know what's in store for you. It can turn out to be the success vision that you have for yourself. And like Rashi said, it could turn out to be something different, which you might start calling as a failure. But also know that failures are stepping stones to that success that you've envisioned for yourself. So just take that first step. And like Aarti said, if you're really passionate about something, then chances of you going wrong are lesser. The chances of it taking time are possibly more. So, so trust that feeling. Storm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that leap of faith. Uh, okay, uh, on to the audience's questions. I think we have Aman who will be passing the mic around. Uh, just raise your hand maybe. There, there are already hands in the audience. Raise your hand. Someone will just want, just... Tell us who you want to ask your question to and let's stick to one question per person. I think that's ideal. Uh, just in the interest of time, we know Aarti has a flight to catch. I'm making that, I'm making Every sure day. everyone knows. Flight almost sounds like a <laughs> <laughs> Should uh, I say Air India? <laughs> Uh, big fan. Um, I'll just jump onto my question straight away. I run an advertising um, consultancy and uh, with women-led startups, I have noticed that they kind of, uh, with the product, they also take the moral dilemma away from the consumer. Ki, aap sahi cheez rahe ho, ye hum insure kar lenge. Aap product se matlab rakho ki product, I'm sorry, I'll just keep shifting from Hindi to English. <laughs> uh, aap ये देखो कि प्रोडक्ट की फंक्शनैलिटी क्या है वो चीज एथिकली प्रोड्यूस्ड है सस्टेनेबली मैन्युफैक्चर्ड है वो सारा हम देख लेंगे बट लास्ट ईयर वी हेल्प्ड अ कपल ऑफ सच कॉर्पोरेट्स बिकॉज दे वांटेड टू डू सम मार्केट स्टडी वी हेल्प देम अक्वायर अ स्पोर्ट लाइक एन एंटायर स्पोर्ट एंड ऑल ऑफ दीज कॉर्पोरेट्स फॉर ऑन बोर्ड दे सेड कि हां तुम्हारा मार्केट रिसर्च का जो सिस्टम है द सर्वे दैट यू आर डूइंग इट्स ऑल एक्यूरेट एंड एट द एंड ऑफ द डे जो स्पोर्ट था सो इट वाज अ वुमेन बाइकिंग इवेंट जो तीन ब्रांड से हमारे को सबसे हाईएस्ट एक्सपेक्टेशन थे तो कि ये तो आ ही जाएंगे ऑन बोर्ड बिकॉज वी इंटेंडेड टू गेट लाइक टेन थाउजेंड वुमेन बाइकर्स इन अ सर्टन प्लेस द बाइकिंग ब्रांड्स बैक्ट आउट एट द एंड मोमेंट बिकॉज दे वर लाइक दिस आइडिया इज नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क सो माय क्वेश्चन टू यू इज दैट यू नो वेन यू आर काइंड ऑफ ट्राइंग टू बैलेंस द प्रोडक्ट एंड द मॉरल यू नो द मॉरल Uh, again, uh, you know, taking that moral dilemma away away from the uh, consumer, and you're so sure that जो कर रही हूँ वो तो सही कर रही हूँ, but then the daddies of the industry or the grandfathers of the industry are like, मतलब इतनी सारी औरतों को bike पे बिठा के वो भी super bike पे बिठा के एक जगह पे कैसे लेके आओगे ये तो हमें बिल्कुल भरोसा ही नहीं है. तो उस time पे how do you like kind of say कि मैं सही ही कर रही हूँ? I'm pretty sure मैं सही ही कर रही हूँ. Who's your question for? For all of all the women. <laughs> First of all, I would say go to the mommies of the industry, but uh, whoever wants to take this one. Gazal, do you want to maybe take that one? Uh, so, uh, see, this is a very specific problem, and I, th I think for me to be able to answer it correctly, I'd, I'd like to know a lot more around what happened and what was the pitch and who was your real consumer, like in this case, the brands, etc. Uh, but for you to prove that point, which is where you said that they did not believe in the fact that women can come together and ride a super bike or go on that journey. And for them to be able to believe something on that. In my case, I would have actually done a small pilot, created a video, showed them that, and then given them the confidence that thus aa sakte hain, to so bhi aa sakte hain, we will be able to do so, this event really well. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... I will uh, also say keep trying, right? Because I think if I just have to draw a Leap Dot Club parallel, mm -hmm. um, we've had the toughest time raising funds because genuinely, I think people believe that women don't invest in yeah. their professional growth, right? And there is no playbook, so to speak, or there is no time because, you know, maybe apparently India doesn't have so many women. And, uh, and Kunal actually from Titan Capital told us that it'll take you one yes, right? So go door after door and it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's nerve wracking. It's, it angers me till today. And, and in fact, someone told me that, why are you building for a tier two population, I think when I started, but I still remember that 
I think until NZR Ventures came in, I think a uh, couple of months later, and of course, we had Titan and First Check and all these people who believed in us and men who believed in us. And I think that was great. But I would, I think if I just have to answer your question, I will just say, don't go after that one person. And sometimes it's okay not to try to prove your point to that person, right? I think, knock on the next door. Thank you so much. We have Sri Parna who has, I think, in turn with us. I'm so glad to remember. Yes. Hi, Ragini. Hi, Kazal. Hi, Rashi. Hi, Arti. Wonderful conversation. Really glad to hear such a candid insight into, uh, you know, just just problems, regardless of entrepreneurial or not. Um, I'm gonna ask. I mean, this is again for Ragini, Kazal, whoever wishes to answer. But I think Kazal more pointedly. What can be a good solid market research in this digital age beyond the Instagrams and the LinkedIn's and you know going something that could actually blend in and, and forward the idea that uh, let's say a new upcoming skincare brand has to start from a branding perspective. Okay, so I can talk about how I do market research before I launch any brand Absolutely. or even think about the name of the brand. Yeah. Um, we set up stalls in different, outside different stores and malls and marketplaces where we feel that this is where our target audience comes, okay. right? Anybody who's frequenting a mall or a specific store, you'd know that they have access to digital medias, they are on Instagram, and you find your TGs at these places, the relevant ones, go speak to them. Show them the texture of your product. Show them what you're building take feedback, see how they react. A lot, see a lot of digital surveys don't give you subjective information of right. what was that first reaction when they applied that moisturizer on their skin. Right. Or what was that first expression when they saw that three-in-one lipstick mm. at a price of one. Um, all of those insights truly and deeply make a lot of sense when you have these conversations with people face to face. I still do that, my team still does that. Um, before every brand launch, we set up these stalls where we ensure that we will talk with 50 people in one day. We will ask 50 people to ask these 10 questions targeted. Besides that, in every stall, pe, there is one person who is just analyzing the psychology of how our consumers, who are those consumers who are getting attracted? Mm -hmm. Why did they get attracted? Why did they come and ask or inquire? The consumers that we went to, how, you know, how did the person approach? What were the people who were not interested. Why were they not interested, right? Like stuff like that. And that gives you an entire playbook on how should you launch the brand into the market and what should you communicate. A lot of, a lot of words that you should use which might skip our mind. So for example, in India, black spots on skin has a higher attraction with consumers mm -hmm. compared to dark spots. Right. Which is a word that gets used outside of India. So yeah. insight, little insights like these are really helpful. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Hello. Yeah, this is Akshat Agawal, a source person from Ministry of Food Processing Industries. So what is the role of government in terms of schemes, funding, and other kind of support? Uh, what was your experience regarding this? Any one of you? So I think of lately, the government has been uh, quite supportive in terms of the grants and what how it supports uh, startups. And at Flow, we work very closely as well. And we help our members reach out uh, and get access to these schemes and grants. Uh, if you're asking for suggestions, uh, is that what you're asking? No, no not suggestions. Like, uh, uh, Ms. Alag, uh, is there any scheme you availed? Is there any fund, any one of you? Away. From the government? From the government. of Any other kind of support you are getting from the government? So see, our business model is not such that we require a lot of funds, and now we are public listed companies, okay. so any which ways we yeah. have enough that we wanted for the, In, for the next 10 years. I think one thing that the government has started doing really well, which did not happen about five years back as well, yeah. is reaching out to founders and asking them yeah. What is the support that you need? Yeah. How can we help you? For example, manufacturing and setting up a manufacturing unit, which is not on top of our minds, but 
government is the one and like specific representatives and for that matter ministers reach out to you directly yeah. to tell you that if ever you consider that we are here to help you with xyz and these are the three or five things that we can yeah. do better i think that is a that is a very encouraging a very forward looking approach from the government that we are seeing yeah. and we are very very happy it helps us collaborate with them even better yeah. creating a positive environment absolutely yeah thank you Hello everyone, I'm Ratika. Uh, thank you, Ragni, for uh, sharing the details in the Leap Club so that we could attend this wonderful event. And thank you all the speakers for sharing your valuable insight with us. My question is to Rashi. Uh, Rashi, you have sh created your business uh, in a time where it was not in the need. You created it because you felt something that should be you know, uh, established in the market so that people can get benefit out of it. So I've recently, Recently not, like a few months later, I left my job and I started traveling full time and created content and create, uh, my mo motive is to start, to share the mindful aspect of the travel. So uh, my question to you is that uh, you created something when the need was there, but people were not aware of it, right? So what was the challenge uh, which you uh, faced to establish the uh, Heads Up for Tales, because I have actually volunteered Heads Up for Tales when I was doing in the college. So I uh, uh, like associated with Friendly, Friendly Kusika, and then I did some volunteering for you as well. So, yeah. Um, so I think um, really, you know, it is about building awareness, right? Sometimes, I mean, listen, when Apple was launched, none of us knew we needed any of that, right? We never knew we needed a smartphone or all the apps that we work with. We, nobody had imagined it. So I think it's about finding a need. If it's coming to you, if you're seeing that white space, if you're seeing a need for it, then I think just go all out and build authentically. It takes time because you have to raise awareness. But at some point, um, the need and what you, the value that you bring, it will align and it'll be great. Thank you so much. And with that, unfortunately, we'll have to draw an end to today's session, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for patiently sitting through the last one hour. I hope it was as much fun for all of you as it was for us. And any parting words from any of you? Parting words of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving your valuable time and listening <laughs> to everything that we had to say. <laughs> but you guys were a great audience. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Love being here. Thank you. <laughs>
As you all know that uh, this program was curated in partnership with uh, Fiki Flow. So I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of Fiki, thank Fiki Flow for their support, specifically to Madam President, uh, Ms. Verma. Thanks for all your support, ma'am. And I'm sure this is just one of the program, and there are many more opportunities where we'll get uh, to partner and uh, do joint activities. Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, other uh, activities uh, which Fiki Startup Committee has in pipeline. And uh, we'll keep you updated about that. And uh, we'll look for many more such opportunities to interact with you. Uh, there are certain areas which our committee has identified agriculture and disruptive technologies, as my colleague has also mentioned earlier. Plus, there'll be a lot of other sessions where we would be specifically you know, curating from the funding perspective as well. So we'll be in touch with all of you. And we really look forward to engaging discussions going forward. I also take this opportunity to thank our partners, Titan Capital, uh, Boba Bhai, and Aza. Uh, without uh, their support, this program probably wouldn't have been possible. Uh, Boba Bhai has very kindly you know, uh, put up a stall outside uh, the auditorium, and they'll be serving uh, bubble tea. So please do enjoy that. <laughs> and before uh, you leave, uh, uh, we have some refreshment arrangements. Please do join us for that. And uh, I'm sure many of you would have received the gift hamper from Aza. Those who haven't, uh, please do collect on the registration desk. Uh, with these words, uh, I thank you all once again uh, for this uh, beautiful session. And uh, before we close, I, I would like to invite uh, Rohit to present uh, gift hamper to all our uh, panelists. Rohit, please uh, join us on the desk. Ma'am, may I request uh, you also Thank please you join us? Uh, I'll request Rohit to present the uh, hamper to uh, President Flo. Uh, uh, we have all the uh, esteemed guests. I request the FITT team to felicitate all the guests on the stage, including Mr. Somit Gupta. Yeah. And also to uh, this to Mr. Rohit sir, you please. Give a gift to your friend. They may not be useful for me. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists one more, once more. Uh, it was absolutely a delightful and very, very candid session. Thank you, Ragini. I, I had no clue you are such a fantastic moderator. One of the best moderations I've seen ever uh, in all times. And thank you so much for the panelists for being so candid and open in sharing your uh, sharing your advice. It was delightful to hear all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just, just so, sir. So uh, thank you very much. We can always say that women not only mean business, women also means brilliant. So thank you once again. We request all the guests to have a good photograph. Thank you.